theoretically running. Now I'm going to wait to see if I can see some information from the chat. If not, I'll have to put the overlay up uh, like I did before, which at least allows me to see kind of a piece of it. Uh, at the moment, I'm getting that uh, just a mess. Anyway, Jackson may or may not be showing. Uh, he may be a little bit delayed on it, but we have Professor Dan, Dan Stern Cardinale here because we're going to be talking about, because I'm going to be linking information on uh, uh, him and uh, Walter uh, Walker had done um, uh, stuff on uh, uh, Carter and Jensen and so much. There's delightful amount of stuff to be talking about. So first off, however, delightful. I want to get my... Um, um, Jiggery pokery going on screen here. Wait a minute. Uh, let's um, type some here. The bloody buttons there. Let's get our clickety clack going here. Hey, the wonderful world of typewriters and analog equipment. Welcome to the Tip Project, Troubles in Paradise, the Methodology of Creationism, TortuganWordPress.com, and of course all the books and so forth and so on, and uh, the links that we put in. Um, all that stuff that I have at the Tip Project is open access. Anybody can download it and make use of it. Um, it's uh, material on uh, the history of biblical apologetics and human evolution and uh, the dynamania dinosaur stuff and Kent Hovind and all that. The one thing it doesn't have is an index, which of course makes uh, the book. Uh, rocks were there and all the other stuff much better on that. So uh, we're going to have be having a, a several comments. Let me get my other little image knocked up in here. Uh, application window, come on, tab, are you, there we go, and I'm going to stick an image up here, and there we go, Oop. which is a picture of a man that was done by an old painter that's made entirely of fruit. And the reason why I'm going to be putting that up as an archetype is the idea that if you take a thing that means something else and piece it together as components, you can make an image of what you want it to be that's completely disconnected from what it actually is. This is not a person. It is not even a Magritte pipe. It is a picture of a man made out of fruit. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is because I had a wonderful uh, illustration in my head popping up as to how to convey just how much of the data field is being obliterated by young earth creationism. We know the universe is about 13 billion years old, give, it, give or take. And creationists like the ones who we're gonna be discussing uh, through the show today uh, are uh, thinking in terms of a 6,000 year time frame for all of that. Well, that's about a 2 million factor obliteration of data field. So I was trying to figure out a nice little way to give a good image of that. So think about um, the movie Avatar by, um, what's his name, James Cameron, and Titanic, also gigantic, both of those three-hour epics. Cleopatra, for those old farts like me, uh, with Liz Taylor, that runs four hours in the regular theatrical version. Come with the Wind, with all of its problematic circumstances today, but it's still a classic motion picture that's also four hours long. And the entire Lord of the Rings series, all three movies, you got about 24 hours worth of film footage there, which works out if you think about how many frames per second are going by, is about 2 million frames of film to get all of that in, 24 hours worth of movies. So there's our 2 million thing. Now what creationists are doing are taking stray frames out of those 2 million and slicing them up so that there's just a little teeny piece of the frame in place and then they're gluing all of them together, bits and pieces, to make one single frame that's just one frame long that reflects their cartoon version of things. Say a picture from Star Wars or Casablanca or the Muppets Take Manhattan. It doesn't particularly matter. But they're taking 24 hours of movie, slicing it up, taking bits and pieces out of occasional frames to make a single frame that's supposedly to show that Gone with the Wind and Cleopatra and the Lord of the Rings and all of these others are in fact Casablanca or the Muppets Take Manhattan. That's the differential as to how much data is being thrown out in the field uh, to create the little cartoon version. Now, speaking of cartoons, 
Uh, oh, uh, my current April 2021 Acts and Facts showed up today. Isn't that precious? And it's got it's going to be mentioned in the new book too because uh, it, it, they're going on about extinct radionucleotides. They're complaining about the, the fossils still say no missing early evolution of land vertebrates and um, uh, the painted desert fossils in flooded mud flats. And there's a whole bunch of crap and all that. That so we'll we'll be keeping up on the speed. But the main point is a book that poor Dan is aware of and has had the misfortune of having read already. The Nathaniel Jensen replacing Darwin thing. Your image is frozen. Oh, there you go. You got a, a, a motion again. I may um, have just been being still. That's, that's a possibility. Jensen could have that effect on you. Uh, just as I did with Rupin Sanford's book, which I was glad that it was helpful to uh, uh, Erica because I was able to give her my reference bibliography that isn't, when Rupin Sanford did the book, they didn't have an index. They didn't have a reference bibliography. You had no clue. You would have to go footnote by footnote to find out what they cited. This clown does exactly the same thing. There's no conventional index. There's no uh, uh, a reference bibliography. All of the sources are as you encounter them. So how do you know what he cited? That's where you construct a reference bibliography. So that's what I've been doing going through bit by bit. And now we're into the glorious world of chapter six, where he dangles some biogeography, which is going to be the main topic of the thing. And then the second topic will be uh, Robert Carter, um, his 2020 piece on African origins of carniv carnivory and Dan and uh, Walker had dismantled his thing on genetics, and I'll be putting links to all of that. That's what we'll get to. Uh, just in case our stream screws up, I like to get in my thank you to all the patrons for the project uh, right off the bat. And so I'd like to thank Hendrel and Colton, Eric, Ali, Soros, and Zeshi, our colleagues level researchers, Travis Adams, <coughs> Ian Chen, Convert Me, Stephen Early, uh, Eat Neal, James Fitzwater, History Minor, Ralph McFadden, Apologia, Benjamin Simpson, and the Speed of Sound. Assistant researchers, Duranku, Todas, Real, Christopher Johnson, our friends, Daniel, Steve Bauman, Marigail Pedos, Insects Are Cool, Devin Miranda Reeves, Horton Nielsen, Paul the Skeptic, Buffalopagus, Bo uh, Rasmussen, Alex Stone, and Paul Williams. And I will continue to thank the legacy patrons, uh, patrons that helped at one point or another. Uh, Dan, Jody, Mike, John, Keith, Andrew Dyer, Yui, Mona, Brad, Daniel, uh, Nyanya, Staggles, Sun Sky Stone, Ugly Truman, Truths, Everett, and Sewer. Uh, it's been all a, a huge difference in a retiree's uh, economic dream, especially the number of people who have just stuck it out in the middle of the COVID pandemic, because I know how dicey everybody's finances has been up and down, roller coaster and all that. So the fact that you've stuck it out to the old fart talking on the screen, um, thank you very much. So back to the joys of replacing Darwin. Um, what struck me, this is one of the few ones where literally I have no source to link to to let the audience track down the sources that Jensen was drawing on. I mean, he put up a few that are actually uh, existing. They're all secondary stuff. They're just, you know, website material. There's no technical literature involved. But the main point was, on page 155, he drops a parameter by his uh, own what, cha what chapter is that? Sorry, my oh, pages are different. Page, I got chapter, the six page, chapter 6, it's, it's chapter six, uh, thank a couple you. pages into... Uh, Thing, page 155 of the print copy. Um, it's where he um, uh, is talking about that notion. I discussed it last week. He came up with this 12,000 year figure because he drew on a technical paper that contended that domesticated plants and animals apparently were domesticated in the last 12,000 years. And from which he then leaps to the idea that all of those species oh, would have come about. Is in that the only point? Is that yep, the part where the he part. says, because evolutionists agree, and we have all this domestication that the evolutionists say took place in the last 12,000 years, that means that necessarily all this other speciation must have yep. taken less time than that? Is that because what he, look at all the changes the that have been is, made, how, how easy peasy it is to get to the speciation. The problem is that natural species are more than breeds and varieties, and they have more genetics than that, and they have more ecological interactions than that. I'm so gonna, it's, it's a I'm gonna pull up that quote because it is insane. To. I'm gonna pull up yeah, that you quote know, because it is legitimately insane. 
get, yeah. I gotta find it. But I have not only do I have this this ebook annotated, but I've taken screenshots of the it. Was next, it was in the same vicinity as the little chart that he put up of the number of species versus the number of families. Figure figure one point uh, six point one or two something like that. Uh, it was fairly early in the chapter. That's what I did last week. Anyway, he has a quote that I was delighted with. Quote. If all of them arose within 12,000 years, then at least two and a half species have formed on average every year, unquote. But Here his is. flood model it. is not a 12,000 year frame. His flood model is a 6,000 year earth with the flood 4,300 years ago. So if all of them are coming off of Noah's Ark, it's not um, uh, um, a, a two and a half species on average every year. It's seven or eight species a year. Now, he tries Can to I wriggle some more. Can I give you the quote before we go on? Yes. Because this is yeah. bonkers. Everyone should understand how insane this logic is. Here's the direct quote. I got the ebook pulled up. Here's the direct quote. If the greater variety of breeds took 12,000 years, then surely the lesser variety in species took the same amount of time or less. By the evolutionist's own logic, species must have arisen in 12,000 years or less yeah. direct quote because we did all our domestication and selective breeding to get all the different breeds we have within the last 12,000 years therefore because there are fewer species than there are breeds these species must necessarily also have originated in that time frame or less that is I, i'm not going to swear on your channel that is bleeping insane <laughs> that is nuts. We do that once in a while, so it does happen. But it's fair to say that it's one of the most gobsmacking jumps to the conclusion. Like, without him, and, and, and if you'll notice from, from your own looking at the reference material, he offered zero justification for that conclusion jump. Zero. And, and it's understandable why he didn't offer any, because he can't. Nobody, nobody would ever accept that. That is that is, that ranks up there with the claims somewhat later in the book. I think it's later in the book where he says that we have to assume constant rates of mutation accumulation over time because evolutionists assume other constant rates like uh, radiometric decay. Therefore, we, by your own logic, you have to assume constant rates of mutation accumulation. Those are also not the same thing, and those are not equivalent, and those that logic does not follow. It's that order of ridiculous is is what he wrote there with the twelve. Those association thing. events would be glaringly obvious in the genomes of the various organisms on Earth if it had taken place. Yeah, yeah. And nobody, creations... nobody would have been overlooking it. It would be there would be papers on it. There would be PhDs galore on all, all, all of this stuff if that had actually taken place. And the fact that nobody has spotted this is kind of a clue. <laughs> and it's worth noting that there is the famous paper on bottlenecks that creationists like to point to showing that most mammal groups have gone through a bottleneck. Um, the problems with that for creationists are twofold. One, the they're not all at the same time. They're off by a lot. And two, the time spans are in the six figures of years, and it's like 100,000 for this group, yeah. 200,000 for that group, 300,000 for this group, they're all off and they're all way outside the limit. But it, like, if what Jensen says is correct, then those data make no sense because by the same uh, uh, methods that you would use to say, oh, aha, 12,000 years, that would show up in those bottleneck, it's a mitochondrial bottleneck data, those branch points would show up. They don't. They don't. It just like it's not even a thing where like he's saying something that like I don't know. No, he's saying a thing that's been tested. We have the data on this one. It's nuts. Now it gets even worse because not only has he got this problem with getting those species, but it's the biogeography, and that was the next bit here. Because not only has he suppressed his own chronological frame, he then tries to figure out, well, how come people aren't noticing all these species that are originating really quickly? And he starts bringing up how far long it was before Europeans colonized the world. And so the idea that conquistadors might not be noticing speciation, perfectly reasonable. But he puts in, quote, the speciation stuff would, quote, would have been distributed around the globe. Uh, 
remember, we started Ararat. So there should be a radiating speciation cloud as the mm -hmm. animals, those little kangaroos, hippity hopping down to Australia and all the cute little tenrecs somehow managing to make it to Madagascar and all those little llamas managing to make it to Peru and all of those frisky tomato plants racing along <laughs> to get to the Americas as well. He forgets completely that you have the biogeography <laughs> of plants and animals, not just people. Yeah, the biogeography for plants is a good one. And until you said that about tomato plants, I'd literally never thought of that. But it does make one wonder why the tomato plants made it to South America and but chocolate vanished from everywhere along and the way. Potatoes, and potatoes. And maize. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Tequila <but> cacti. <laughs> you know, it it makes and you the wonder, bats doesn't that it? Pollinate them. It makes you wonder. <laughs> and it is it is an interesting coincidence that not only did these very specific groups of plants end up in the Americas, but also their very specific pollinators ended up in the Americas yeah. and, and nowhere else. And died out in the flood by some weird coincidence matches up with the post-flood distribution relationships that we can physically see. This is this is this is a monumental can of worms. Uh, I've got, I've been culling out, I've been going through for the last month, the horrible task. If you ever were to visit my house you, and go down to the basement, you would see fire hazard stacks of printouts that had been accumulating over a decade or more, particularly during the hiatus period when I stopped work on the project. I was still collecting data, but not putting it into my reference field. So I had mammoth amounts of information without little boxes on them that I hadn't put in yet. And it suddenly dawned on me, no, I, I have to sort this out because there's a ton of stuff. Four stacks, each about a meter high of printouts just relating to the dinosaurs, flood geology, all of that crap that I realized a bunch of that really probably needs to go in the new book. And I got to find out what's in there. You know, the the, um, uh, the lost squadron of that aircraft that landed in Greenland and got buried down in the ice that Kent Holt right. and others were dealing with. I discovered... Oh. I had I'll be not, right back. My dog is my dog is barking. I think at the closed door right here. I'll be right back. <laughs> okay, we'll see your face in a moment. I'll still get the story to the, to the to the audience. That not only did we have, I have one packet on the uh, the lost squadron, two packets, three packets, four packets. Turns out five independent packets of information on that damn lost squadron that I had gotten and heard it from some creationist and got some more information on it and went back and kept on hitting the same point over and over again. <coughs> now I can pull all of that material. I had five packets of material, Dan, on the damn lost squadron that I had encountered this information again and again from creationists who would bring it up on social media and I would have forgotten that I had checked it out already. And so that I would then research it again. Now I've been able to pull all of that crap together in one spot. So I've been maneuvering through, um, resorting and rearranging so that theoretically I will have my basement floor back. I will have my pool table available <laughs> again without stacks of paper sticking on it. And it will be absolutely delightful. It'll be, it, it, it's, it's well worth the effort. Big chunks of this stuff uh, relate also to some subsequent books. Jackson and I intend to write uh, that uh, it meant that I could pre-sort material uh, for that stuff on um, the hidden subject book number two and the hidden subject book number three. <laughs> That's beyond that and maybe even some books beyond that. So uh, uh, as a, as a post-retirement hobby, I'm not running out of projects to do here <laughs> as Jackson. So we're having a lot of fun with all that stuff. Anyway, Back to, back to berating poor little, little Jensen. Um, the fact that at this critical juncture in his argument, he doesn't even bother this time to even cite creationists. The last couple of times uh, that he would bring up some of these things, when he brought up biogeography in the previous chapter, he snuck in um, a, a big lot of stuff from fellow creationists that he put in the footnotes. He didn't want to be so bold as to stick it up into the main text, but it is down in the footnotes. But he didn't even bother with that this time. It was just, there's, it's just complete. There's like no paper. references. I just flipped yeah. through these pages where he talks about like the fact that we hadn't explored, you know, 
the world had not been explored. And by the way, Europe is really small compared to the other continents. Yeah. So maybe we missed it. Yeah, yeah. There's no references for any. He's just making up numbers for no He's good. He's presenting life. a bold claim that is in fact at the core. It's at the very center of his entire argument. It's one of the most pivotal pieces of assertion and that he needs to establish that the biogeographical distribution of animals spreading out from Ararat. Oh, we have Walker the walking fish. Do do do. Don't see a picture yet. Let's see what Hello. we got going here. Hello. Hello, Hello Walker. This platform. How's it going, y'all? We hey. we're just we're running amok. Jackson isn't even showing up. He's been kidnapped by gypsies or some terrible <laughs> thing has happened. Space aliens. I shouldn't say the gypsy thing. That's an old. That, that dates me. That's uh, not, that's okay not politically anymore. correct. It's not allowed today. Uh, it, it, it that shows you the difficulty. I mean, I it was never okay, thinking, but now people are recognizing that it's not okay. Is what, exactly. Yeah, because there 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 are uh, people that have been oppressed historically around the world. It's just you know terrible. Uh, anyway, um, we're ragging on Jason. I know. I heard the uh, <laughs> the thing where he was saying that domestic breed or the diversity among domestic breeds disproves the long divergence times between species. Uh, like, <laughs> I, I had to jump in after that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I was impressed. When you when you and Dan did the video uh, mm -hmm. late last year, uh, dismantling his genetics uh, and and uh, dealing with stuff, uh, you uh, you Walker noted the 2011 paper by Trombetta uh, that directly refuted Carter's notions about a particular uh, African haplotype and all that. I go, oh, this is glorious, and so I realized I was going to be putting that into. Uh, the human evolution chapter uh, that Jackson and I will be doing down the road for rocks too. And I, I wanted everybody to know about it on evolution hour because. Mm -hmm. Oh, RJ, you still uh -oh. there? Oh no. We lost an RJ. Oh no, we lost RJ. Hopefully it doesn't crash entirely. So but what he was, so what he was talking about everybody was uh, Carter uh, a couple of months back put up a piece on Walker, correct me, I think it was CMI, right? And yeah. it was about, it was basically like six like justifications for how humanity originated in Africa and not somewhere else in the world. And none of them made any sense at all. Uh, and I don't even, I don't remember most of them at this point, but it was mm. there were several of them that were contradictory with each other and several that did not address the fundamental problem of human origins for humanity oh no this is a problem. <laughs> we're running the stream now we're i don't even know who's right i'm surprised the stream is still going right now um sorry everybody hopefully rj makes it back soon but yeah so to catch everybody up what we were talking about was chapter six of replacing darwin which is a he makes some really bonkers claims about biogeography and rates of speciation and does some truly spectacular gymnastics to justify his numbers, like the fact that only European... Ah. Oh, RJ's back. Thank you. We're goodness. back. Yeah, it, it re it re hooked up here. Um, it's entirely the problem for me, and, it's, and that's another reason why I wanted to get so much of the intro and crap that I'm going to be linking to out of the way at the beginning of the show, just in case something like this happened. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that way, that way, uh, because all of all of the links, everybody that watches the show will know that all the linkages that I'm going to be putting up, um, uh, I take care of as soon as the thing has posted on Restream, and so that, that I like everybody to know right off the bat, even if the show were to end up a tiny tr truncated five minute show because everything was all screwed up, but we've already been on for about twenty minutes in that, so that's RJ not too bad. You should, if you can, because you're you're running the show. You should put yourself back in the power seat. So so walk ah, around. Yeah, I have. No, I I could just... care less. Yeah, it, <laughs> this this mug is not that photogenic, so it doesn't really matter. As it's, Abraham Lincoln uh, said, if I had two faces, do you think I'd be wearing this one? Be choosing this one. That that's like I am. Uh, I know that the world is not a solipsistic illusion. That uh, because if would I invent something that looked like this? If I were in that cut, no, no, this is not probable. Uh, I would pick something. All right, so where were we? Later. We were talking. We were talking no, Carter we? We were... and and human origins, and also Jensen mm -hmm. and biogeography. And either of those yeah. things are fertile yeah. ground for dunking on them because they're all bad. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll I'll bring up a point that I I don't think you brought up necessarily in the discussion of Carter, but I put it in my notes. Um, in that article, Carter 
tries to accept some terminology without credit. He has um, Gould's acceptation idea and casually claims that polar bears seem to derive from ancient cave bears with links to extinct bears from Ireland, quote. Uh, and he cites this 2011 paper by Edwards, which I'll be putting a link into in, in the uh, the video, which goes way back before Carter's time frame. In other words, he's misrepresented the source. And uh, I don't know if you recall that little bit about the polar bears or not, but... Uh, <laughs> I, I just pulled it up, so I'm looking right now because I don't recall. Oh, there it is. Um, polar bears derived from ancient cave bears linked to extinct bears from Ireland. Thus, acceptation was clear that that's not what acceptation means. Ron no. Carter, and, and it also know it, that. The paper as well goes way, back, way before forty five hundred years or six thousand years. It's it, it it's a complete misrepresentation of the data. How, how is he using acceptation? Is he using are it you? to mean like anagenesis? He, no, um, except, um, acceptation uh, is. Uh, I've never uh, even heard. I've never even heard Gould even try to use acceptation to refer to anything in relation to speciation. Acceptation is a biological property that's going on inside of a metabolism where a thing that is doing one thing gets accepted by whatever means change in regulatory sequences and that where it takes mm -hmm. on a new here's, function that it didn't do originally. Here's two mm -hmm. examples. Here's two examples of acceptation. Uh, uh, you've got uh, receptors in cell membranes called G-protein coupled receptors. They're, they're proteins that zigzag back and forth across cell membranes. They're chemical receptors. Uh, but a mutation bajillions of years ago, I don't remember how long ago, uh, but yeah. prior to the divergence of all the major animal groups, uh, made one subset of G-protein coupled receptors uh, uh, sensitive to photons. And that those are the basis for opsins that all mm -hmm. animals with photoreceptors use. It's that same lineage of protein. So it was a chem chemoreceptor and it became a photoreceptor. Another mm -hmm. example, a little closer to home is um, feathers. Yeah, that's, uh, what I, that's my like favorite one. Vertebrates. Feathers were originally for insulation and only later became accepted yeah. for flight, right? So mm -hmm. you're taking something that does one thing and it does another thing. What Carter says in this, in this uh, blog post is mm -hmm. uh, that uh, the third option is called acceptation. This is similar to adaptation where a tool is changed to suit a new purpose. But in acceptation, the tool is simply repurposed for a new use. And then he goes and talks about cave bears uh, and then, thus, acceptation was clearly at work in the rise of polar bears. I think he's thinking uh, about okay, the fact okay. that I'm the polar sure. bear has a white coat. Mm -hmm. but I just wasn't following what he was saying. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 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 I think there's been no scientist in the field of evolution who has been oh. as authority quoted and as misunderstood by the authority quoters than Stephen Jay Gould's he's, stuff. He's using it. He's using it to to denote a change in function without a change in structure. So what he's saying is that the claws of black bears are great for digging up roots, uh, and the teeth are good for stripping berries off a stem. Um, those same teeth and claws are great for killing seals. So uh, it was adaptations for yeah. herbivory were then accepted for carnivory. But which, without, without any new components okay, in that, now I, the same. I don't think Gould would ever have classified it as an acceptation. I think it, I, I don't know if, I don't know enough about Gould's original formulation, but that's a, I'll say a non-standard way of applying the term. Let's yeah. Put it that way. Oh, oh, and and a uh, Walker, uh, his other cute little buzzword, in addition to punctuated equilibrium that he co invented with Eldritch. But are you familiar with the word spandrel? I am. I am familiar with the word spandrel. That's another ghoul, is it? And that's another mm -hmm. word that is one. I I love it as a concept. Spandrel is, is a is... thing that originally does one thing and then generates as a byproduct. A secondary thing that doesn't actually do anything yet and then takes on a function that it didn't it's, have before. It's it's different anybody, from an acceptation. Anybody watching, there it's one of the foundational papers of the second half of the 20th century in evolutionary biology. It's called yeah. the Spandrels of San Marco. Spandrels of San Marco. Yes. It's a very theoretical <laughs> With Richard Lewandowski. It's about this idea a spandrel is a thing in architecture where if you have uh, a square frame and an arch, you end up with this roughly triangular space, and that becomes oh. an architectural feature in itself. But it's not, it doesn't originally serve a purpose, but then it can be co opted to be functional yeah. at, subsequently. And th this and is Daniel this Dennett, Daniel Dennett snark, excuse me, but that's actually a pendentive. <laughs> <laughs> 
I think Jackson's in the back stage. Uh, I don't uh, see him floating around here. Okay. He's not on my window. I suppose that they can have as, enough, as much as six people, but I'm not seeing an additional um, uh, bit to hit. So if I do, I'm apologize. I'm still getting uh, connection issues, difficulties, but I'm not seeing any window uh, showing up for him. So if that's, let me, let me look downstairs. Wait a minute. Oh, there. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Let me <laughs> press the button and, and test oh, the no. odds here. That's horrible for four. Why did it divide it like this? <laughs> what? That's terrible. Why Come am on. I still big? Just Come on. I'm trying to get him in. Just there we go. Well, that's awful. There we go. <laughs> that's not oh, let me, let me try it like this. It's going to be, it's it's gonna be a Fibonacci as we, no, as yes, we continue yes, to yes, add yes, more yes, people. Don't it's a Fibonacci show. You know, divine ratio it. Just, just make it like... Don't make me big. At the very least, RJ <laughs> should be big. Hey, but you're the one with the PhD here now. You, you that have, doesn't you have matter. Bragging this is right. your show. This is your show. I know, but I, I am but a lowly BA in history. Who am I to say? And and I am somebody who is totally offended. Uh, uh, Sal Cordova, uh, Bill Dembski has called me smarmy, uh, and uh, so I am. I am but so. I am but on scum compared to the lofty people. <laughs> Anyway, For what it's worth, we've been Dembski going got, on about mad at me once, so that was fun. We uh, we've been going on about the joys of, of Robert Carter and Nathaniel Jensen screwing up on stuff. Uh, uh, Jensen has blown his, his argument to smithereens on the biogeography issue. I mean, if he'd only been honest so enough bad. to say what his model was up front and and make a point of trying to test it out, evidentially bit by bit, but he's keeping it dangling, dangling, dangling in the footnotes and the references without even having a, a, a way of dealing with it. And, that, and that's just bothering the heck out of me. <laughs> I have You've also... Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I feel like... Um, I, I don't even know how the, the creationist arguments like seem appealing, because I feel like... Um, I guess as I've learned a bit more about genetics, it becomes how obvious it, it becomes obvious like how bad they really are. Um, I don't know, like the the one that we were talking about earlier, where he was saying that like the selectively bred organisms, you know, the diversity that we've generated there easily outmatches like wild organisms. You you could easily test that, right? You could just say like, what's the yeah. ratio for synonymous sites to non synonymous right. sites? That's like intro level bio stuff. You can, and then compare it across species. You can objectively measure the rate of evolution in different lineages. Yeah. Like, you yeah, can well, do I that mean, math. It's not that hard. You can hard. even just find uh, actually, a relative. That's the book that I just got was on yeah. uh, evolution and action. Yeah, it's on comparing different lineages and yeah. seeing the, the rates of evolution. Yeah. 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 It, it, that the irony is that the shell game that the creationists have to put up is that if there had been a differentiation, there's actually two functional bottlenecks in their model. The first bottleneck is the Adam and Eve bottleneck, and the bottleneck for all the created kinds that were made in Eden. There was only a single creation event taking place over a week. That's it. Everything that comes afterward is merely variation within a kind. And all of the kinds that will be the arc thing, they don't bother about the insects and the plants, um, are, yeah, will then count. go on the arc, and that's Hurt. whittled down to just the two or seven, depending upon whether they're clean or unclean, and then your Noah's Ark and family bunch that come across, then that's only 4,300 4, years ago. That bunch then is the second bottleneck from which all extant species must have derived. Well, really that fast. recently, that's, that's younger than Utsi the Iceman, Every single organism on the planet would betray that those bottlenecks. It would be as plain as day. You couldn't get around them. They wouldn't have to be hunting around in the genome for them very hard. They would stand out like a sore thumb because that's way yep. too recent for uh, the, the toolkit that genetic reconstruction and paleogenomics can do. There was a, a, an example, I can't remember whether we cited it in uh, this book or a previous one, um, uh, about um, there was a, um, a, a species of, um, I think it was a lizard or something, where uh, it was parthenogenic and they were wondering how it had derived and they realized that they had the genome of the lizard oh, and they could yeah, deduce that was in rocks. what the other, 
Yeah, they could deduce what its its original parent was, the one that, that they, and eventually they found the actual animals that were were generating that particular, they predicted exactly the genome of it based upon this parthenogenic lizard. Wait, now, that you're level, me, do they make, so you're telling me that evolutionists make predictions and then test them? Shocking, yeah. shocking, but, isn't it? But it was, Jason makes it's funny because I met I'm the um, the guy who's the, uh, the he curates the museum at, at LSUS. He like does his research on parthenogenetic lizards. And so I happened to go there and he gave me the paper on it. And I was like, RJ, check this out. <laughs> yeah. That's it's cool. cool. Yeah and, yeah. and that's the neat thing about the, the network of things that you discover. And that's why, and you deserve the big bucks there, the big picture, uh, because you have a level of credentials. Look at the fact that I am unworthy. You had Michael Behe on your show. You lured <laughs> Michael Behe into a discussion. Wow. <laughs> you know, I, and, and I will say, we were just talking via email today. We're going to set up another one. He's going to come back. Um, and I'm also not to, not to, not to um, tip any hands too much, but I got, uh, I'm also talking to um, Kevin Anderson is going to come on at some point. Um, Ooh, flexing, uh, um, all this flexing. You know, like this, this format of just having like an hour long conversation is really nice because you, yeah. it's enough time that you can like, pick an issue and focus on it, but like people who would maybe not be up for like an adversarial formal debate. Yeah. Would be, yeah. And are, that are doesn't exhaust them. It can just sit there. They're, you're just drawn. And because you have the PhD, uh, we know that there are so many creationists on that that are so snooty that that bottom poor, pathetic, lowly folk like myself, you know, well, that they will not deign to have a discussion with the likes of me. Uh, but uh, you have some credentials at a university that uh, make it uh, sound much more uh, useful. Maybe, although B I mean, was still just a vacuous nothing. Maybe that'll. Maybe that's why. But I don't know. Um, but I'll, honestly, I'll take what I, I mean. My rinky dink little channel. I'll take what I can get. Channels yeah. creation myths. Everybody like subscribe. It's link. what it is. Just gonna. Just gonna get. Yeah, that I think. I think Thanks, Angelo, No, Sal. Sal honestly, I think was fuming over the fact that you had. A, the Darwin tetrapod uh, devouring creationism, and he was talking about how blasphemous oh, that was. And I, I was reminding him that that's Philip Johnson's trope. He he was railing on about that in the early, uh, late 1990s, and I think that's where Sal got it from. It's Dan, I just, secondhand. I just have to say, Dan, that was a very good chat, and it was very insightful. <laughs> I thank yeah, Jackson. I appreciate that. Thank you. And I, I came away saying. One, it was, I think, maybe for both of us, it was surprisingly cordial, considering that we disagree, sure. we disagree on yeah. literally everything. Um, sure, but okay. also, I thought it was, for as cordial as it was, I also thought it was extremely revealing. Um, yeah. Yes. Because, uh, you know, there were, there were I th by my count, I, I was trying to keep track in real time, but I think there were five or maybe six times where I said, Okay, but can you quantify that? And the answer was yes. yeah. something other than yes. Here's the here's how you do it. Yeah. Also, it, also, it was, Dan, the, it was, the, I know it was a little bit cheeky, but the uh, is succinate part of the uh, the TCA pathway. <laughs> I laughed. I just laughed out loud when I heard you ask that. And he he paused long it enough was, just to be like, ah. <laughs> there were two moments where. I got the better of it, where like my, my the id got the better of me, and I got a little bit snarky, and that was one of them. Yes, that oh, was roboting okay, a little bit. Was... I think it's my, I think it's my uh, uh, stream difficulty. Uh, well, well, regardless, I'll, I'll it was good. Bit, so, I'll plug a bit. I don't think you've read um, Evolution Slam Dunk, uh, have you, Dan? I have not read Slam Dunk. I'm now about. I've been reading uh, um, The Rocks Were There, I, so I'm weird in that I read like at least five books at a time. So one of mm -hmm. my current books is The Rocks Were There. So I'm about a third of the way through it. Um, uh, how how so you liking don't... it so far? Yeah, honestly, I really enjoy it a lot. And the, the funniest awesome. thing about reading it is every word I read. Uh, Jackson, I know you're also an author, but literally every word I read is in RJ's voice in my head. <laughs> yep. No, yeah. No, I read it the same way. So yeah, you're that's fair. <laughs> so it's yeah. anyway, in, in the in the uh in the evolution slam dunk, I had an extensive section on Michael Behe and the chloroquine case. And uh, yeah. uh the, the thing that I, I observed about that chloroquine matter 
is that BE has a terrible problem conceptualizing the, the nuts and bolts and gritty of what's going on at the biological level. And so he's missing pieces because he's just coming at it kind of superficially from the upper level and not digging down very deeply. He had the same problem with impopenum uh, in the Dover trial, the Kitzmiller case, where he just waved a paper that was years ago, ironically by Toleman, who's a British creationist. It's a weird uh, a paper trail on that. I discussed that uh, uh, at the TIP website, I think in TIP 1.7. I've got a thing on the impopenum case. Uh, but the chloroquine thing, when I really looked at the details, there was a particular paper that had meticulously worked out how there were multiple pathways to the existing mm -hmm. chloroquine distribution. And he just has constantly bullshitted about that. He has avoided the, the one and one only. down the road. Yeah, it's he's saying, look, this is the main one that evolved. This is the time period. And this is I, I asked him about this and a couple other examples saying, so these things that we've observed, does that represent a, a maximum? Does that represent a limit of some kind? And yeah. if so, why? And his answer was, Yes, it does to our best approximation. Yeah. He but, to show you to show you how weird his view is and how vague it is, in principle he accepts common descent. It, for human beings too. He thinks they're okay from hominids. He's not had a problem with that. I actually and, I just to yeah. just to say when I when we were talking the other day, I said it I just said I've I've heard some ambiguity. I think I've heard you say you accept universal common ancestry. I don't want to put it, you know, I don't want to straw man you. I just want to be clear, is that the case? And he said, yes. Yeah. But, yeah. but it's a meaningless concession because when it gets down to the nitty gritty, um, he thinks that that chloroquine barrier means that it can't be possible for mammals to have evolved from reptiles. There was tweaking along the way. It's you see, it's yeah, universal common ancestry with divine intervention. Which that is the fun part of asking them, hey, when was that exactly? <laughs> yeah, or my my killer question, and be, feel free to use this with any intelligent design advocate. Creationists are a different ballpark because they're talking con a constrained time frame. But ask them, how many design events do they think occurred during the Mesozoic? Well, that so, involves so, mammals and birds. And so dinosaurs. where that goes, so where that gets to though is, well, you identify changes that are beyond whatever threshold, right? And then it gets to, okay, what's that threshold? Can you quantify yeah. that threshold? How is your standard appropriate to that, right? That's the, it, it always comes down to, okay, quantify your stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And multiple times in that conversation on Monday, the answer was, well, it seems to me, or in my mind, it's like, okay, I can't use that objectively to look at a situation and evaluate it. Mm-hmm. So really Are you aware but it's intuitive of and also not subjective. <laughs> right. Are you aware of Behe's waffling on the Krebs cycle? More. I've never heard specifically him talk about the Krebs cycle. Except yeah, here, here to was pause the thing. When I asked the, if uh, was by the way, here's one in lieu of evolution slam dunk. If you download um, Creationism Light, chapter four from the old tip website, uh, I go into that matter in there. Um, the thing was is that Every single one of the five irreducibly complex candidates, when you burrowed into his references, you discovered that he was overstating what we knew about them. But the one thing that I was intrigued with related to the Krebs cycle, because he pointedly, in one of the little side bits that he did, said that he does not claim the Krebs cycle is irreducibly complex. And I've never heard him ever say that in any subsequent work either. Well, is it because we know too much about it that we can track down that if you knew a little less about the details, you might take it as an irreducibly complex system. And that that's the problem with the examples that he kept on giving, um, that, that there were huge amounts of information that he didn't know about the structure of the flagellum, about the development of the immune system. But um, another one that uh, I, I alluded to, I think I alluded to in that chapter, um, had to do with uh, uh, Tim Cavalier-Smith whose work, uh, who's a big guy involving with the, uh, I think the immune system. Oh, he, and he told him Kevin, uh, Thomas Cavalier-Smith, the, the microbe guy? Uh, oh no, did we lose RJ? Did we lose him again? Did we, did uh -oh. we lose him again? Oh, I think so we that lost wasn't RJ me. Again. Oh, for once no. that wasn't me, okay. 
<laughs> and then we lost RJ again. Okay, I don't know about the Cavalier Smith thing, but the name does ring a bell. Do, do either of you know? Thomas what... Cavalier Smith, he's a big uh, eukaryote phylogeneticist. Oh, hmm. that's a project. Man, we well, should yeah, do he, a stream on that sometime because that's like, a mess and I love it. He, I've read several of his papers, so he he's has these very interesting hypotheses. There's actually one where he has like several groups of protists I had never heard of, and he basically puts them as whoa. like basal whoa, unicorns. Yeah, whoa. For <laughs> okay, anyone so they're like so I just wanted Jackson, can I just for a second, for anyone listening, for Jackson to go, groups of eukaryotes I've never heard of. <laughs> Those are some obscure eukaryotes. So okay? I'll give you an example. Mantamonas. There's Twelve of them. Mantamonas. You ever heard of it? I, I think we're no. <laughs> Wee! Or Rigifilidae. <laughs> Rigifilidae is another one. So, anyways, they're these basal eukaryotes, and they're at. He puts them, or well, they're eukaryotes. He puts them as basal unicons. So before our, or sorry, so after our split with plants, but before our split with amoebozoans. So between in that area, he puts okay, them kind of okay, between there. Okay, fine. I, I wouldn't be surprised if there was something in there, but that's okay. Well, he also <laughs> moved... Are we talking about um, Cavalier Smith? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh -huh. He also moved uh, the Apusozoans, not Apusozoans, the other ones, uh, and Ceramonadita, the ones that they're uh, sister to. Yep. You could have said you could have said <laughs> peanut butter and jelly right there, and I couldn't tell you, like, that... <laughs> Those words well, Dan, the point is, you're me. right. We should have, we should all have a, a stream on on eukaryote phylogenetics sometime. Oh man, yeah. <laughs> I just, I just actually reworked this for class. We do phy, uh, uh, biodiversity at the beginning of every spring semester for bio two, and the eukaryotic phylogeny. Every time we change textbooks, every year, I've, yes. yeah. I've Man, I'm actually it's not. It's one of my favorite things, and I love it because it's a giant mess, and there's no consensus, and that makes well, and, it and it's, so it's much fun. It's not surprising that it's a giant mess because well, Dan, I'm, everything I'm you have to do is retro analysis from existing uh, organisms that are billions of years removed from their origination, and so duh, there's going to be a lot of problems trying to keep it organized. Dan, I'm curious on your opinion. Do you put Excavata with um, the archaeoplastids, or do you put them as a separate group basal? I don't think arch I don't think excavata are monophy as they're currently classified. I don't think excavates are monophyletic. All right, fair enough. That's also that's a fair point. I think they're yeah. I think they're basal and paraphyletic. Uh, sure. And then I think the next group to branch off would be. It's not really an official thing anymore, like official, whatever that means in this context, but I think it would be um, <laughs> Uniconta, but I think the real name for that group would be um, Amorphozoa or Amorpha. Uh, and yeah. then, so I think it's it's multiple lineages that are improperly grouped as excavates, but it's paraphyletic. I think that would be first, right? And sure. then you've got the uh, Amoebozoa and Epistaconta, and then mm -hmm. you've got everything else, Chromaviolata, uh, Archaeoplastida, whatever else Ooh, is in there. It's not, wanted... it's not Chromalveolata anymore. I know Dan, it's not it's anymore, Chromista. but whatever. <laughs> it's Chromist. I know. Well, and, and aren't, aren't you know a lot I mean. of these critters represented by relatively few living examples? So you have yeah, a, yeah. kind of a, a narrow little limited box. The thing I must say about the Jackson, fact you knew what I meant when I said Chromalveolata gets the point across. I mean, yes, is how, yes, I did. It's how Jackson can rattle off the names of all right. of these taxes and classifications. Right. Was like, it's all tongue twister yeah. time for so, me. So anyway, that's what I think. I think it's it's a, a paraphyletic excavata okay. first, and then Opisticanta plus uh, Amoebozoa as sister lineages. Right. Like, they branched off and then diverged. Plus, uh -huh. if there's any little nitty groups in there, fine. And then okay. everything else. Fair enough. That's fair. I actually, I do kind of like the idea of a paraphyletic um, excavata because of how ancient they are, and it's probably like long branch attraction that they're all grouped together. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I think it, so. Is yeah. there is there work? I, I can't recall right off the bat the extent to which those taxa are basal enough that they're still doing a lot of lateral gene transfer in a bacterial way that later metazoans don't. That's oh yeah, probably fun. Because yeah. if you group them, part of the controversy at the root of the eukaryotic tree is different genes give you yeah. different trees. Which if, if they're doing LGT, horizontal well, wonder is throwing the systematics off. Oh yeah, it's a giant mess, and that's what makes it fun. And that partially means the way we should represent it 
is as a population rather than a specific branching pattern. We yeah, should just in the same way the bacteria have to be treated. Yeah, as a population. we should just acknowledge that there's enough HGT going on that it's not a neat, you know, bifurcating pattern, and just be okay oh, with that. Oh, yeah. There's a there was a paper or there's a couple of papers by um, I think it's Bertastuzzi is the name, and they're on these papers are on the the total phylogeny of of bacteria, and it's fun to look at them because they're very nice. Um, phylogenies, you know, break them down into hy uh, hydrobacteria and terabacteria. But it's like, this is obviously not, you know, not a, a true representation of reality, because these guys are constantly swapping parts with each other. Now, don't you but know, St. Jonathan of Wells has shown that the Saint unclear Jonathan phylogeny of bacteria has completely destroyed the tree of life. Absolutely. <laughs> Got him. So, um, Jeanson, Carter, what were we talking about before we started nerding out on eukaryotic <laughs> stuff? Well, my, my, my main bone to pick with, with Jensen has been that he has a hide-the-ball model for his own notions of what was happening post-flood that he's really very reluctant to share with his readers and that means that he forgets what his model is so he does blithering about speciations appearing all over the globe and by his own model that can't be what's starting out that he needs to work out that radiative uh, um, uh, field of what exactly are the arc kinds they're gradually well not gradually blinding speed uh, differentiating and also spreading around uh, in in the material in the planet. So and I've got how could he possibly document that? I got I got four problems as as you were talking. I came up with four problems with his approach, and it's going to be Only interesting four? to see if I can remember <laughs> Only each of four? them as I say them. <laughs> I'm right? sure. Or if I do a Rick Perry, or if I do a Rick Perry over here, there's an old reference for people. Um, oh yeah. So, so, okay, problem number one, there needs to be a geographic dependence on the rate, right? Because it's radiating from a specific point. And if it's yeah. radiating yes. X number per year, there needs to be a density dependence based on geography. It's not just equally split over the globe. Yes. So that's problem one. Problem number two is the Galapagos Finch example that he uses as a validation for his prediction was not a, uh, was not a divergence. It was a hybridization, which is not the mechanism yes. to specify. Oh, Dan, okay. RJ, and I literally wait, went wait, through wait, that wait, paper wait. with That's standing. I still got, I got to remember that I can't forget the other ones. So Sorry. just give me a go, second. Go, 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 on. go. Uh, I think they're gone. I think they're gone. I think they're gone. Uh, the other okay, one Rick was, Perry. <laughs> mm, yeah, EPA, I got, I forgot the other two. Um, I keep, I gotta, I gotta <laughs> I'm gotta do so the sorry, again, Dan. Department so, um, of Education? I mean, well, Walker, okay, so Walker it was, so it was dense, it was, what we're talking oh, about. linear, no, it was from was, the debate. number three, number three, number three, linear, uh, he says the speciation rates have to be linear, and then, RJ, I know you have the book in front of you, you can look at his graphs, and those are not linear graphs, he takes a no. non-linear path and draws a straight line, but it is not linear, it shows adaptive radiations. <laughs> It show it's stepwise. It shows adaptive radiations, not a linear pattern. That's three. I'll remember the fourth one, but I got to deal with the dog. <laughs> yeah, he, um, he Walker. Just, I don't all know. All he's got to do is just draw a line that's straight, and that makes his model correct. Well, we RJ, you remember when we went over that paper on the Finches with standing, and he didn't understand it. You remember when that happened? We oh, okay. So it was after. It was. I think it was after the debate. We debate in quotes. We had with Neff. So we went over to Neff's channel for the um, for the after show, and Standing was there, and we talked to Standing about this paper, the Finch paper, because it's a they call it Big Bird or whatever. Yeah. And so we were like, I'm familiar with the example. According to the paper, this is what they expect under hybridization events, and he he like clammed up, and then and then um, uh, Neff came in with something else, and then we talked about that for a while, but. Yeah, I don't, Wait, remember so the, I don't remember, remember the fourth problem. I don't remember the fourth <laughs> problem. So just go with the three. The fourth yeah. problem was the EPA. <laughs> yes, exactly. The Gene Leitner 
um, uh, is the one that I always like to, to remind everybody of. She was, she's functionally done the baromenology paper, working out what the avian kinds are. And I think it's like 197 or something like that uh, kinds. But the point was, are the diagnostic finches. Because she not only has all the finches in a single kind, but a bunch of their evolutionary cousins. So she has 1,200 species all in a kind. Obviously, every single one of those had to have originated by whatever archetypal finch kind was kept in the little cage aboard the ark and then flitting out from Ararat makes a beeline for the Galapagos, I guess. Are, are we talking about like all fin? Like, are we talking about finches or like tanagers? Or does he, do uh, they all, include all, all of them? All the, in the traditional finch family, this so, is 1,200 species and tanagers. their close cousins. Um, both tanagers, tanagers and family, finches. Right? I actually got that wrong. Yeah, they're um, tanagers and finches are are both they're their own fr families. Fringillidae for finches and Thropidae for tanagers, and they're both you got your passerines. Grass quits. Yeah, and the grass quits and uh, bullfinches. They're also close to the tanagers and the, those the, kind of things. The main point is Leitner has functionally hmm. accepted all of the evolutionary relationships in the immediate vicinity of finches. So any okay. creationist <laughs> that tries to argue that well. Those, those Galapagos finches don't demonstrate evolution. They certainly do. And we can cite a creationist who agrees with it. By the way, Leitner conveniently leaves out 100% of fossils. She never mm -hmm. deals with any fossil data. Yeah. So she tries to work out what the, what the avian kinds are without any reference to any of their fossil records. So needless to say, Esperornis and all those other bunch, whoop, off her scope. So are, is it like all Passeriformes in, in this one avian kind? Because if they're so, large I, I families, that's ridiculous. bird okay. families okay. are okay. kinds for her. And that's, again, very traditional. Uh, um, uh, the view of, of kinds going back into the 19th century uh, was at the family level. So th th there has been no evolution of the creationist baromenology <laughs> models in the last 150 years, if you want to get really picky about it. If the one mm -hmm. proviso, human beings have got to be their own kind. And Jensen says that specifically, and it's, I think, my favorite line of his entire book. It is the greatest, like, just say the quiet part loud of mm -hmm. <laughs> it, except for maybe that creation.com slash fitness, where at the end they say we can only win if we change the definition. Yeah. Maybe other than that, because that one's okay. really. But the, that's great. The, Yep. one about humans being their own kind like obviously mm -hmm. except humans don't count is yeah. incredible and while we say i don't know how rj i don't know how long you plan for this to go but i'm gonna just oh, try to as find that need line to, or as long as the stream runs <laughs> so it's we're... amazing i'm gonna try to find that line it is the greatest most yeah. revealing line of jensen's entire book it is and, and that, that, that is the human evolution core, regardless of what like any creationist says, all creationists are obsessed with human evolution. Mm -hmm. And they may or may not focus on it. But even Philip Johnson, who spent most of his book, Darwin, uh, Darwin on Trial, not discussing human evolution, it's still revealing that his single longest chapter was the one on human evolution. So they have got to keep humans separated from a lower order. And that means they have to get into a mess when they deal with all of those almost humans. So then they have to deal with whether or not Neanderthals are actually humans after all, but not Homo habilis or whatever. Mm -hmm. Y'all are more familiar with like the Lec the Yek literature than I am. What what do they say about like the phylogenetic nesting problem? Because the only thing I've ever seen is they just like, oh well, Lucy was a monkey. <laughs> You Knuckle take that one, Cassie. Uh, you got that one. You there? Okay. The concept of like any that's creation is phylogenetics go, no, is hilarious. That's what they say. Shh. Ooh, that's what they say about the nesting problem. Walker, Walker, shh, Walker have shh, you have seen? Curtain. Have you seen um, the one of the papers? So RJ and I spent chapter five discussing uh, baromenology, mm -hmm. and we talked about so many papers where it's it it's just they they. They get to the point where, I mean, they reify, the whole, the whole of creationism is about, like, reifying something that is arbitrary, that is, like, mm -hmm. definitionally arbitrary. And so they are trying to, to build a hill out of sand, and it's, and I think they know that, 
and that's probably why most of them aren't engaged in baromenology. That's why, like, so few of them actually do it when they have yeah. to. Like, this is the one thing you guys have to do, and none you of them do one it. one job. And yes. don't rely on barcoding to do it, because that doesn't work. Because that makes yeah, humans... It's, 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 <laughs> makes it way worse. It's yeah. pretty yeah, hilariously there's no, there's bad. No way worse. And, and yeah. to give you a bigger context on this, uh, Dan and Walker, uh, the thing that, if you look at anti-evolutionism in the 19th century, it was very easy for them to keep humans separate from everything else. So the kind of debate that we get into in the modern era of creationism wasn't a problem for them. You could have creationists who would allow the trilobites and dinosaurs evolve. That, that was okay because humans were special and there was nothing connecting them. Oh, there were those Neanderthals, but those were just deformed uh, soldiers from the, the um, <laughs> Napoleonic War or something. And there was virtually See no fossil. You had some skittery stuff that was showing up from Asia and all of what we now know about uh, African uh, fossils, which by the way, Darwin suspected that humans originated in Africa. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but nonetheless, there was no evidence for that until the 1920s and 30s and then on. And it's in that period that creationism evolves into the uh-oh we have got to obliterate all of evolution because whatever we accept for trilobites and sauropod vertebrae will spill over into human beings if we let it. So we've got to push all of it away. And at that point, it's an all or nothing position. And that's the case for intelligent design, young earth creationism, old earth creationism. They, 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 they have to draw the line by not drawing a line. They, they could get away with that prior to the uh, World War I. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think um, uh, Dan is frozen up there. He was he was I'm, robotic. No, no, a little enough bit. And I'm just scrolling. I'm trying to find the specific passage with humans and like, ba 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 ba. But humans don't count because yeah. reasons. I'm gonna find it. I have because what I did as I as I read um, uh, uh, replacing Darwin, I was taking screenshots and and annotating the screenshots. So I'm just scrolling through. Mm -hmm. I, I I have it right here, and I'll read it when I get to it. It's uh, <laughs> boy. Have they ever proposed a tree for hominidae at all? Uh, yes, no. actually, I have. Oh, I, oh, I they, actually they have one in this. In this one, oh, there no. is a tree, and I'll show you. Just give me a second. Um, I <laughs> will show you the tree for hominidae. Have like gorillas it's, and pan as like. I guess, yeah, they're, it's gorilla. They're, 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 so it's ridiculous. orangutans <laughs> on their own. It's orangutans on their own. Gorilla and pan together, and humans plus all of Homo. Together. That's in Jensen. Oh Wait, my god! They uh, put, they no, they it's um orangutans on their own. Got it. Yeah. Wait, orangutans are a separate okay. kind? So this is right here. This is The New Creationism by Paul Garner. This is the 2015 edition. And this is what he shows right here. So oh, it's... Oh, um, more, pages, uh, more pages. Okay. Uh, so it's... Uh, here you go. It's Does it have orang... also by the themselves? So it's orangs on their own. And then this branch right here, this Y-shaped, that's uh, chimps and uh, gorillas right there. Mm. And then down here... These extinct ones, those are the australopiths. So those are not yeah. sharing common ancestry. Those are all extinct. But and related. Up here we have in, humans, in their own separate lines. Neanderthals okay. and um, Ergaster erectus. and okay. Erectus and presumably uh, Floresiensis uh, in there, right? So you've yeah, got more, more PDS groups. for you. Uh, okay. By the way, does the Garner book have an index? Uh, yes, it does. Oh. Okay, let, let let me demonstrate the methods approach right off yep. the bat. Mm -hmm. But if I were to have that book in it front of me, I would be looking in the index first. So check to see whether or not there are therapsids, <laughs> mitochondria, uh, endosymbiosis. I will, I will tell you, having literally finished this book yesterday, I will tell you the answer is no. But I'll look. Mm -hmm. But the answer is no. Yeah, uh, I see, because I, I have a theraxids. series of... I have a series nope. of litmus test items. Uh, endosymbiosis. Um, and, uh, no way. <laughs> nope. Uh, what was the other one? Therapsis, endosymbiosis, and, and, mitochondria. and mitochondria. mitochondria. I think uh, that one might show up. Like, like I said, having read this book over the last like five days, the answer is no. Not even uh, mitochondria. See, see, if he mentions what? mitochondria at any point, the, the section for K is endosymbiosis. That's a diagnosis. There's nothing. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> one of the three is probably kinds. There's no mitochondria. The only MI wow. is Milky Way and Stanley Miller are the only MIs you get. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, Bingo. Okay. Both very Let's useful is it and kinds? important to evolution. Is it kinds? No, nope, it's uh, oh yeah, it is kinds. And all it says for kinds is C Barrimans. And then it's Kepler and um, I don't know how to say Co Cooper Belt. Co Co I don't know Kuiper how to belt? say that. Kuiper Kuiper belt. Belt. Kuiper belt. That, those are the that's other two K's. That's yeah. sort of part that's going to be showing up. Uh, again, it's all part of rocks too, because we're going to have There's a whole thing on creationist like cosmology and the Kuiper belt, the Oort cloud, a stellar formation, all of that stuff. There's, uh, there's, there was too much to put in one little itty bitty book. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Do you realize how? <laughs> That, um, that that volume that you have of the rocks were there was literally within a few pages of being too big to print. <laughs> oh, but the, the reason I asked is I'm pretty sure I remember AIG like nesting all of Hominidae together except for humans. It's, it's, and to right. me that's just so weird. Right. Mm -hmm. It's all of Hominidae except Homo sapiens is yeah. together. Yeah. I don't know about some of the fossil ones. I don't know about... So I don't know what they do with that, like, the Australian one of the four apes. It depends because <laughs> yeah, well, some know. of them uh, will put Geneva. some of them will class the Australopithecus and like Sahelanthropus with the other the other apes, and some of them will do that with some of the hominins, and some will do that. Uh, some will group the other hominins or the other uh, Homo with humans. It just all depends on which creationist you're looking at. There's that fantastic yeah. table of the the disagreement, and let me see if I can yes. pull it up real fast. Oh um, yeah, we we have we have we have that it's in our book. In proof it's in the book, in the right? It's book. in the book. It's it's wonderful. Yeah. Where um, we added on, like where we added on some agreed. newer data from there, and the same pattern goes. What there has been is a general evolution over time. There has been a tendency for creationists to add more and more of those hominids into the humans. Mm-hmm. Because the the boundary layers get very vague, and uh, I, it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me if the Creation Museum is still around a hundred years from now that they have modified their displays to have Adam and Eve being an Australopithecine. Oh, <laughs> Here you go. Um, for anyone wondering, uh, would it be okay if I shared my screen for a sec? Oh, oh, um, uh, uh, I don't know if, if you can, do can on here. Um, I don't know. Um, are you seeing a menu where you can do that? Go ahead. Yeah, I here we go. I think I, I have it. A... Just a second. Uh, it's this one. Uh, yeah, if you can, if you can share, allow. I'm perfectly I'm happy with you that. doing that. I'm I don't know what your menu looks screen. like. There's nothing in. to share. Yes, I've given you permission. Share the screen. Allow. It's not I letting me. Know. I don't know why. Yeah, it's I don't know that me. I've got a... Oh, uh, oh wait, there we go. Yeah. Allow. No, it's telling me I can't. I don't know why. Yeah, I, I don't know what I can do to uh, change that for you. Oh, wow. I don't well, see. If anyone can imagine, it's um, it's literally there's a table of all these different fossils. And then across the top, it's an x-axis on the top, is a bunch of different creationists saying what they are. And then down yeah. the table, each one is like, this one's an ape. And then it's like, ape, 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 human, human. Oh, I'll... Ape, 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 Let human, human, human. Hey, babe, babe. I'll show Good you the one from, uh, oh, yeah, God, where are we in here? I'm sure it's the same table. Uh, more evolution. Do, 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 do. Oh, I don't know why I can't share it. Yeah. Into, uh, it sure. Horse evolution, pinnipeds. Hominid chronology, page 153. Um, I'm sure it's the same table. Well, we made some modifications to it because... Um, do, 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 come on. Because, uh, oh, yeah, 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 there we go. Uh, Lubinow and Taylor and Gish contradicted themselves on in their own uh, context to where the ones in great big boxes of the same author over years changed their viewpoint as to what one was what. Page 158 of the rocks were there. See, there's a reason why I keep this handy. <laughs> Hard copies are great, <laughs> but the they, they they have to evolve over time because the, the blurring lines they they've had to throw in the towel on Homo erectus quite a while ago, and the problem is as as they get more and more 
data on that later Australopithecine bunch and that flurry of taxa in there, it's just harder and harder for them to draw these lines and the, the, the moving target. It'll never involve genetics because you can't retrieve genetics from stuff that's three million years old. But you, you can get so much on the morphology and the, the dynamics, you can get stuff on brain endocasts, um, all of that. I think uh, we lost uh, Jackson. Is he still in here? Uh -oh. I'm still, still here. On there. I haven't got still there. There we go. Good. Old. I'm just I'm just um, listening, taking it all in. Yeah. I'm going yeah. through. It's, I'm going uh, through the. Um, I'm going through Jensen's book. I'm going through my screenshots, trying to find this one passage, and I'm finding. I, I just found like I keep finding amazing things, like this one, uh, where he says. Um, that the mtDNA and Y chromosome sequences have the potential to act as strict absolute molecular clocks, uh, implying that the rest of the genome cannot. Yikes. Big yikes. I mean, you is have to Is there any with... wonder that his arguments have not taken hold in the regular genetic community? You've got to deal with recombination, but like there's ways to do that. It's, <laughs> you can figure that out and use other stuff as a molecular clock too. You know how yeah. I know that? Because I because I've used with people that have done it, mm -hmm. and they've said, "Oh, here's how you do that." Well, there, there's <laughs> algorithms oh. that you can use to like account for recombination. Just wait till yeah, they figure that the out. Most, <laughs> yeah, the most common one that I know of is called Arc recombination Weaver. detection program. Oh, really? I know Arg Weaver, which is pretty similar. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. It's just, yeah, what, once you start what thinking of. Uh, forget all the information code it's notion. Once you good. start thinking about the genetics as a topological oh, frame, now you can start applying a whole new level of mathematics to analyzing how it, it jostles around. I found it. You want to hear? It? You want to hear the line from Jensen? Well, of course, yes. Yeah, 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 like absolutely. Minutes. So he's talking about all these things about evolutionary rates and predictions and divergence and yada yada yada. To clarify, the prediction I made above for animals naturally has an exception for humans. <laughs> naturally. The creationists, creationists have long explained human origins apart from primate ancestry. Okay. Uh. Would you like to justify that assertion? No. No, he would not. Nope. He just moves on. And this is this has been the the inevitable bit, and so the reason why all of modern anti-evolutionism has to take an all-or-nothing approach is because there's no way they can keep those principles from spilling over to human beings in the fossils, in the genetics, in the biogeography. They can't give an inch on any of it; otherwise, they're gonna the whole thing goes. It like literally, he just literally says, "I'm describing how." all of animals i'm i'm explaining all of animal bio, biodiversity but humans don't count he's acknowledging right there in black and white that if you apply his techniques to primates then humans share common ancestry with chimps and gorillas and the rest but it doesn't count because we make an exception for humans and the, the one thing that, that for those of you uh, who decide to go into studying some of the baromenology principles, it's like a parlor game. It's what are they leaving out? How are they trimming their data field? If, if they arrive at a monobarum, oh. it's probably that they're not leaving so much data out. But if I they arrive a at a holobarum, it's guaranteed they're leaving data out. I found such a good one for that. Oh, my goodness. What? Reading this book. There was a line, RJ, I mm -hmm. literally thought of you while I was reading this book, because there was Another a line. Another one to put a, a screen share of. <laughs> there was a line I mean, a, a where, where Paul Garner, he was talking about, uh, so you all know Uranus, the planet is tilted, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not so much that it spins, is it kind of rolls, right? It's weird. Yeah, it's over, almost uh, up, uh, up, up, upside down. Yeah. And, what, and what he said was, well, you know, the explanation for that is that it's an impact knocked it off its axis right well that doesn't make any sense because if that was the case that would have ejected all of its moons and five of the uranian moons are in line with the equator and i read that sentence and thought he didn't say there were only five moons he just said there were five 
So <laughs> I went and looked it up. Turns out there are 20 something, 30, I forget the number. It's a lot more than five. Most they of them found a lot, are and all not, gas giants have way only, more moons than they realize. Not only are most of them not in line with the equator, but just as Garner said in this book right here, if there was an impact and it caused that shift in Ooh. axis, it would eject most put, of the moons. Put, put well, a PDF of that up. Uh, you're you're going to be having more I'll, and more. I'll snap it for you. That, yeah, because that that's sure an issue that's going to be coming up again in rocks too. Because there's a because whole discussion. The, Here's the punchline. giants. Here's the punchline. Garner says that well, if there was an impact, that would knock the moons off of the equator and eject some of them from orbit. But five of the biggest moons are along the equator, and I went, hmm, that's. What, he said five large moons are along the equator. Said, hmm, that's weird. So one, there are a bunch of moons that are not along the equator, and two, just Uranus has the either because he doesn't know about difference. them or he's suppressing information. No, he knows. Uranus, because the wording was very precise, and Uranus has the largest difference between planetary and lunar mass of any planet in the solar system, meaning that a bunch of moons were ejected at some point, exactly as you would expect. But you know, I can trump all of your Garner quotes with Henry Morris from the 1970s, who insisted that the craters of the moon were created by lightning bolts thrown by St. Michael in his battle with Satan. I am not Absolutely. making this up. RJ, you remember when I did the video on uh, uh, misunderstanding abiogenesis? That was the, the people who did that video, um, and I, I'm drawing a blank on the names, but regardless, they're not creationists. They're not young earth creationists, let me put it that way. But they believe there was a battle between like angels riding dinosaurs and demons. Oh. oh, that's where that's where you have a whole subculture of wackalunary that that goes along where bits and pieces of creationism are picked up by ancient astronaut crowd and uh, the super civilizations of the past. Cremo and Thompson, who are often uh, secondarily quoted uh, by creationists, but they're Hare Krishna Hindu creationists who think that human beings have been around for millions of years as, as right. advanced people. And so you get this weird cross fertilization then with that and the cryptozoology bunch. And then you've got the intersections with the UFO crowd and, and you get these weird cross fertilization stuff that goes on that you think if there's any limit to how stupid people can be, just leave it at the door. They're going to outdo you. <laughs> Exactly. It is after so 11 o'clock, so I do need to be going to bed relatively yeah, soon. Yes, and we, we've been at it a little over an hour and 10 minutes. And, and we will just thank you for, for coming and having a discussion here. Um, you're always welcome at Evolution Hour. Uh, we'll see you all next week. And we are, oh, oh, just wait one second because I need to put on my stupid uh, uh, rocks advertisement. Let's see. There we go. Get that in there. <laughs> Because that's um, uh, uh, that's called shameless plug time, uh, as we have um, do, 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 share the old screen. Uh, that um, there we go. Um, Peter did a wonderful job of assembling this ad for our book, and um, we like to get it across in there. Whoops! Come on. Am I not seeing the thing on the window? Yes, I'm not seeing it show up. Oh no. Hmm. Well, I'm not seeing it on my screen, but if everybody's seeing it, fine. Anyway, the rocks were there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Get well, R. Jane we'll Jackson's stop that. book, everybody. It's good. Never mind. Buy our right, book. We'll go forget Give that. us royalties. Buy the book. You buy want money. Buy the book. <laughs> yes. First of all, it makes an excellent doorstop because it's very heavy. And if you throw it at a creationist, you can break their skull with it. And even worse, <laughs> if you read the contents to them. <laughs> we do not okay. advocate violence against creationists. Usually. Yeah. Most of them. Yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah. Anyway, no we are now ending the stream, and we will see you all next week, and uh, hopefully we'll have a little better connection, and we'll be able to find out if anybody was watching the show, because I never got any of the chat stream. 